Hey everybody, this is Sam from West Virginia Overtime. Sorry I haven't been with you guys uh, the last week or so. Um, I had plans to do a podcast on whether coaching was an art or whether it was a science. I, I've heard both uh, last weekend and some things have been happening. So I wanted to fill you guys in. So I kind of want to go ahead and start off with the topic that I had picked or chosen for uh, last week with is coaching an art or science because I've I've heard it both and I'll tell you in my younger years um, I felt like things were black and white I felt like this is how you shoot a basketball this is how you throw a football this is how you swing a bat this you know is how you field a ball this is how you get out of the blocks and track um, this is how you set a volleyball whatever sport and so I always thought the there was a science to coaching um, there's stats there's analytics um, you know you're keeping up with how they are actually performing um, you are we have actually progressed in probably every sport and gotten better in it as we've gotten more scientific with it. We've um, all parents and, and coaches and players have probably watched ESPN's Science of Sport, where you know I, I love the one where they actually break down how a baseball pitcher throws a baseball, and it goes down to the science of it and the tools you use and and how you can increase your velocity or how you can change the curve on the ball and and all of that so I always thought you know sports has a science and if you can perfect the science of whatever sport you're coaching or whatever sport your kids playing or whatever sport you're playing then you can get better. You you can, you know, make yourself a, into a better player, a better coach, a, a better parent, better person helping, you know, young kids. I think as I've gotten older, though, I've recognized more of the art of coaching. And, um... What I mean by that is there are so many coaches um, around the world that you can read about, you can pull up videos on, you can go to clinics, you can travel and go, you know, to their actual school, you can set up telephone conversations, you can email them, you can, you know, messenger them, and they will tell you about the art of coaching. It's not a lot of times that you go to a clinic or you sit down with a college coach that they're really breaking down technique. Um, I find that when coaches get together, you hear them talking more about the art of coaching. And by when I say art of coaching, it's more about the relationships, the how you you build and work with your players, how your players work with coaches, how the parents work with the coaches, how the parents work with their players, um, and how that actually affects things almost more, especially on the middle school and high school level, which is what we're de de dealing with here at West Virginia Overtime. Um, I have seen so many teams throughout the state, well, they are, you know, good year after year after year after year after year. And when you sit down and look at them, you know, a lot of people I see in the newspapers or announcers or, or whatever will say, well, that team is good because of that coach. And if you ask them, well, what do you mean? A lot of times they'll talk about their system. 
you know, they're they're running the three four system, or they're they're you know, uh, in basketball they're they're running a uh, certain offense, uh, the dribble drive. Um, certain you know baseball teams are employing this particular system or whatever. Well, I think when you sit down and you watch a certain team year after year after year after year, you would think that people in that area would catch up to their system. I know uh, my mother, he has been coaching for 40 years, and he is one of the most active winningest coaches in the state of West Virginia. And he, his comment is, has always been, people know what we stand for. People know what we're going to do. We have to actually do what we're going to do. We're not going to surprise anyone. And like I said, let me repeat this. He's been coaching at the same place basically for 40 years. Um, he has had kind of the same system. So it's not his science of coaching. Because when you actually break down those teams, you know, through the 80s, through the 90s, you know, through the, the 2010s, um, you're seeing completely different players. You know, their talent level is not the same. Uh, it's not that he's taking them at the beginning of the season and taking them from a two up to a five every single year. It's not that. So I really was searching, what is it? And like I said, when you get around a group of coaches, um, it seems like they always go back to relationships. And so I think it's more the art of coaching that can make you bring up your program. Um, there are a lot of good teams out there and they're good year after year after year after year because that team's players will run through the wall for that school or that coach. They will do anything they can possibly do to make that coach at that school, that community, proud of them. And so that's an art. Getting them to buy in to your beliefs, to what the community stands for, what your school stands for, becoming part of that one. I, I have been seeing that nationwide on a lot of coaches twitter posts the hashtag and then one and for those of you out there some parents may be listening and they may not be part of a one program um what that is is one unit becoming one team becoming you know one school one community and bonding and becoming one and I think when you are trying to create that in your school or your community throughout all of your sports programs, it's an art. It's getting those players to buy in. It's getting them to build those relationships with those coaches, but also to build those relationships with each, each other to create that true team that we've talked about before. And... I think that that's kind of hard to do. I think getting kids to actually buy in, getting parents to buy in, um, 
is a hard situation getting people to get along. Uh, we all know that we at different times have conflict with each other over different reasons, and we're adults. Well, our players, our middle school and high school athletes, they're going to have conflict. And how we get them to deal with that, how we get them to talk through things, how we get you know, them as a team to come together, talk through things, and so that it doesn't divide your locker room where you know certain people are on one side, certain people are on another side and things. That's an art. And how you teach that, whether you're you're a parent and you're teaching that or you're a coach and you're teaching kids how to, you know, confront situations, but yet talk it through. And a lot of people automatically assume that when you use the word confront, that you mean it aggressively or you you are taking some kind of strong action. No, when I use the word confront, it's just calling it out. It's just saying this is happening. That is, you know, standing up to a situation. And getting kids to use the right tone when they learn to confront a situation or bring up a situation is an art. Um, it's really an art taking a kid and trying to mold them and give them leadership qualities. Um, you can't take a, a kid and kind of throw them into the deep end of the pool and say, all right, now you're my leader, um, lead this team. You can't do that. Um, they're going to sink. They're, you're going to have to jump in and, and, and try to save them from drowning because you need to actually work with them on becoming a leader. Uh, we name captains at the beginning of the season, and so many parents and coaches don't step back, take the time, and say, this is what I want you to do. This is how I want you to do it. Then let that player do it. And then come back and make little corrections or tell them, hey, great job. I'm proud of you for doing this. I'm proud of you for doing that. That's part of the art. There's no science to it. Um, you know, you're not going to be able to go to the bookstore, buy a book. You're not going to be able to go to Audible, download a book and listen to it. You're not, you're not going to be able to get a YouTube three-minute video on how to create a leader on your team. That comes through experience. That comes through you working with people, you being around and having mentors that do it. You know, you hearing other coaches talking about it and sharing your knowledge. Well, I said, you know, I wanted that to be a topic for, for last weekend, and things just kind of spun out of control for me. A lot of you know that, that I am a coach, and that I am in season right now, and I had planned on, you know, putting up this podcast on Monday and everything, and something happened to me, I was actually cleaning my glasses, and I broke them, and I don't know um, where I acquired all of that finger strength from cleaning my glasses that I, I broke them, but I did, and I went to um, the eyeglass store and said, hey, I, I need you guys to make me some new glasses, I can't see, <clears throat> And they said, well, you haven't went to the eye doctor in the last year, so you've got to get a new prescription. You've got to go to the eye doctor. So for all you coaches, parents, and players that are listening to this out in wherever you may be, um, go to the eye doctor regularly. Go to them yearly. Um, I found out when I went to the eye doctor it had, it's been probably two or three years since, since I went. I have been putting it off, and I know that I'm bad. And please do not write me emails telling me how awful I am. But uh, if you want to talk about this particular topic or uh, whether coaching is an art or a science and give me your views on it, as always, you can hit us at uh, wvovertime at gmail.com or you can come over to the Facebook page, Instagram page, or um, Twitter at uh, 
WV Overtime. Uh, hit us up. Um, but they told me I had not had an eyeglass appointment and that I needed to go to the eye doctor. So I went to the eye doctor and thought, oh, they, they luckily got me a next day appointment. And so I'm thinking, oh, I'll go to the eye doctor. I will quickly get, pop into one of these one hour or three hour shops or whatever, one day solution. And I'll have my eyeglasses and be ready to go. Well, it didn't quite work that way. Um, I found out I'm old. Um, I need bifocals. Well, they don't do those in an hour. They don't do those, you know, in three hours. Um, so I realized rather quickly, oh, I am not going to have glasses to coach tonight. You know, we have a game. Um, what am I going to do? I don't have, um, contacts. I cannot, and I know that this will probably get a lot of you to write in, but for some reason, I cannot stand the thought of sticking my finger anywhere near my eye, uh, to put a contact lens in or to take them out. So, uh, we tried them one time when I was probably, I don't know, 10 or 11, and I eventually could get them in, but I could never get them out. And the doctor would actually have to get them out for me. And he agreed with me when I was 10. Um, yeah, this is just not for her. So I don't have contacts. Yes, I have a backup pair of glasses, but they're sunglasses. And so I am thinking gee, what am I going to do? I found an old pair of glasses, and I thought, well, I'll put these on, and I was so blurry, it, it was better just not to even have them on. They were, I guess, very old. So I'm facing a situation where we are taking on two of the probably uh, toughest teams on our schedule. I was already, you know, worried about this week, worrying about how our players were going to handle things. And then I'm thinking, oh, no, now now I'm blind as a bat. I can't see. What am I going to do? And, you know, I'm, I'm not real sure how I'm going to handle this. Well, anyway, we, we go, we take the team to where we're playing, and the team starts warming up. I realize being around basketball my whole entire life, um, I feel like I can see better. I feel like just walking into a gym, it's like, you know, my eyes have automatically adjusted and gotten 3,000 million times better. Well, I realize that... I can see because not only I've been in basketball gyms throughout my life, you know, the court dimensions are the same. The bench setup is usually fairly the same. You know, the basketball is the same height. Yes, some of you are remembering the Hoosier scene. But I also realize I know my players by how they walk, by how they run. Um, I almost know my players, I know quite a few of them, by how they stand or just their body language. And so those of you that are parents or coaches that are listening to this, those of you who are players, you can also close your eyes think about a teammate, but coaches and, and parents, close your eyes and conjure up what does it look like for a certain player on your team or on your child's team? What do they look like? Do you know how your athletes run? Do you know how your athletes walk? I've realized that that's the reason why I felt I could see better. When I walked in there and I saw my players 
in their uniforms, you know, they were going through warm-ups. I could actually tell who it was by the way they moved. Um, thankfully, I have a fairly good relationship with most of my team, and I can do that. Um, so that was one thing I learned, that even though they were blurry, even though I may not be able to see their number, or even though I may not be able to see their face clearly to see, you know, a smirk or, or to see them rolling their eyes when, you know, they're 30 feet away from me or whatever, I still knew who they were. I still knew their actions and could generate an idea of what they were doing and how they were doing it. But they say, and I think this has been the most surprising part of coaching without glasses, is the fact that they say if you lose one of your senses, it's almost like your other senses pick up. I now truly believe that. And I encourage any coach or parent to do this. Um, obviously not players while you're playing, but if you're on the bench, um, I encourage you to just close your eyes for a minute during a practice or even, you know, maybe 10, 20 seconds during a game and let your other senses kind of take over. Because I realized in this week that I have been without my glasses and coaching two games, um, I hear them better. And I thought that I always listened to my players. I thought that that was probably one of my strong um, attributes that I had. I found out it's not as good as what I think it is. Um, and and that's almost, I, I hate to admit it, but it really has been eye-opening this week to truly listen to my players and hear them. And, and I'm not saying that I've had any big talks with them or anything like that, but in coaching games and um, going to practice this week without glasses, I have heard that my team probably doesn't talk as much as I thought they did. And you're thinking, well, what do you mean, Sam? Do you mean um, talking in the game of basketball, or you mean talking to each other, or how do you mean? Well, I mean in all ways. I found out through doing this, and it, and you know, it wasn't something that I meant to do. I found out in games, we probably don't talk enough on the floor. We need to communicate better. You know, we need to, to say when we're screening, we're, we need to say, you know, when uh, we're changing offenses uh we need to say when a shot's going up um we we need to say who we're passing to and and things like that we need to call out our offenses better we need to probably call out our out of bounds plays better um i am used to having a lot of control and without having you know eyesight near 2020, like I used to, I found out that I had to rely a little more on my players and my leaders. And I explained to them that they kind of had to step up, that I might be a second slow on, you know, recognizing maybe a defense change or, or maybe that they've changed their offense or something. And, and I just encourage them to to help me. 
And I really appreciate them stepping up. They did that. So they grew this week. But I hadn't planned on it. I hadn't said I need to give them more leeway. I need to give them more um, power. I didn't I didn't realize that. And so that is one of the things that I learned. I thought I had empowered them. But I didn't realize how much me trying to control things had, you know, kind of reined them in. So that's one of the things, you know, when I get my glasses um, this week, I want to continue that. I want to continue to empower the players to read what they think is there. And then they can have me correct it as necessary. But they need to grow. Because as they go to high school, they need to be able to know that. But as they go to life, you know, they're not going to have someone standing there holding their hand, telling them all the office politics have changed because I've got a new supervisor or whatever. They're going to have to know that and read that on their own. And so I need to empower players to do that. I realize that. I also realize that certain players talk to each other but don't talk to other players. Um, I, I realize that you know, we've got little players here in this click, and we've got little players here in this click, and we got little players here in that click, and we got, and and while I thought you know we were really good at being one team, through not being able to see and not taking that for granted, I learned to listen, and I learned to hear. Who was communicating on the bench? Where they were sitting on the bench? Who was sitting next to who? Who was talking about the game? Who was sitting next to this person and they weren't talking at all? And why weren't they talking? Well, because maybe they're not... Um, not that I want to use the word friends because it doesn't matter whether they're friends or not. They're teammates. But because they don't have a bond, because they don't have some kind of relationship, some kind of intermingling on on our team, they weren't talking. And so the absence of sound also got to me and made me realize I need to probably put different players in different situations where they have to depend on each other. You know, I need to take, you know, maybe a, a JV player and put them with a varsity player and help them learn from each other, you know, from from each other's successes and each other's mistakes. Um, it made me sit down and think, you know, for the future, do I need to buddy them up somehow? Do I need to take a older player and put them with a younger player, or an experienced player, and put them with an unexperienced player? Um, do I need to help th mend these relationships? Because that is that is also one thing that I really noticed was when there was talking, but also when there wasn't the silence of talking um, and how they communicated together not only like I said in a game but in practices I found that a lot of the same players if uh, I say give me five on the floor the same five want to to jump out uh, because they're you know they're a unit I need to break those units up I need to put different players of different skill sets together in order to increase them. Um, and it's not necessarily um, me putting a first team against the second team. I don't do that. Um, you know, it's usually, hey, give me five out here. Well, give me five more. You know, and I find that kids that are friends or kids that are alike or kids that play other sports together, they naturally kind of 
go to each other. And so they formed their own groups. And I got to thinking, is that right? Which led me back to, does that make it a science or does that make it an art? Because we all know that how we get along as humans, psychology, and things like that, you know, that's a science. You can use uh, some psychological techniques, and, and there have been studies done on societies and cultures and how people interact and how to get them to interact better and things like that. But is it an art to mold that into sport? and to get them to actually pay attention and connect. And like I said, it's not that, oh no, my season depends on this. It, it does. But coaches, players, parents, them interconnecting, them, them talking to each other, them getting along, them working together, that goes above sports they have to do that you know after they graduate high school whatever job you know um i like to say you know probably 98 percent of us are going to go pro in something else well they are they're, they're, you know, they're going to go be carpenters, or they're going to go be office workers, they're going to go be bakers, they're, they're going to go be truck drivers, they're, you know, going to go be a plant worker, or a coal miner, or, or you know, uh, go in, they may be a friends profiler for the FBI. I don't know where, where my players are going to end up, but I do know that they're always going to have to be around people. And I do know that they're going to be around people that are not exactly like them. And they need to learn to communicate. They need to learn to get along. They need to learn to confront. They need to learn to stand up for themselves. They need to learn that when someone says something, to truly hear it, process it, and figure out how they feel about it, not how, you know, coworker A feels about it. But how, how, how do they feel about it? And be able to state their position, not in a negative manner, but just be able to how, how to state their position. They need to be able to compromise. You know, maybe their position is this and, and a co-worker's position is that. They need to figure out how to get along. It may be that their position is A, and their supervisor's position is B, well, how are they going to get along with that supervisor? You know, I'm sure that not all of my players like the offense or the defense or, you know, uh, the press offense, press break, whatever, that we're all running. But they've got to learn how to handle that. And so that's the thing that I think I have learned most. And I'm glad that I waited and and didn't do, you know, is coaching an art or a science last weekend? Because, like I said, I feel like I've learned so much, not only as a coach, but as a person, um, that I need to learn to communicate better. I need um, to learn when to talk and when to be silent. I also need to learn sometimes my silences. I need to step up and be that leader. I also have learned that when I'm wanting to be in control, such as me controlling, you know, the reads my team makes, that sometimes I need to step back and not do so much talking. Be silent and let others take the lead and so coaches players parents the moral of this whole podcast is number one don't break your glasses if you need them but number two take every day take every week that god has given you and try to learn something from it Try to learn how you yourself can be a better player, a parent, a coach, 
or try to learn how you can make someone else better. Let me say that last part again. Try to learn how you, as a player, as a parent, as a coach, can make someone better. And so I feel like I kind of did that this week. And so real happy. Um, not so happy with my coaching or my team, but I am, I'm, I'm still extremely happy. Uh, I feel like my team grew as a team this week and I feel like I grew as a coach and a person this week so uh, I'm gonna sign off I know you know it's only been 35 minutes but you guys will like that this is only 35 minutes um if you've got a comment or you want to say something or or chime in with any thoughts or anything like I said feel free to hit us up on Facebook Twitter Instagram at uh, WV overtime or email me at uh, WV overtime at gmail.com let me know what you think about this um, is coaching an art or is it a science and what did you learn this week what can you share with all the rest of us and like I've always said uh, West Virginia overtime is for the fans by a fan I will catch you guys soon